it's probably a new area that um, that you know the uh, International Olympic Committee and other uh, major um, sporting governing bodies are only just starting to look at the, um, the the rules and regulations right so what have been the biggest roadblocks for you has it been like hormone levels um, or you know what what has changed recently what still needs to change we need to break down these stereotypes and myths that you know because as a trans woman you also put weight on when you you know I have to really really be really strict on my diet and train train my ass off basically to get weight off so so I think that's probably um, that's the biggest issue um, because I think now the guidelines are there through the IOC and you know so I think we need to get the medical profession we need to get some advocates and some experts there to advocate for us some experts mm. yeah um, have you found that people <clears throat> are worried about um, physical advantage from pre-transition and how long that yeah. takes for that that physical um, advantage from being um, you know pre-transition carrying over into post-transition um, oh for sure I think I think that's a big issue um, and I think it's 10 nanomoles now of I think you can't be above that in testosterone. I think that's what the it's changed since I, I went through my gender testing and I did a max VO2 test. But um, abs absolutely, um, I think there is that perception there that we that we have an advantage, and I think that perception is it's just really hard to change. I I I, I think if someone did it, say transition and the next week they're competing, then yeah, I I think there has to be a, a period. So I think, but it is it is in the guidelines. I think it's a year now if someone's on hormones. And the thing is now, it is getting better. The pre-op people can compete because if you're from Africa or somewhere where you don't have access to money and things like that to have surgery, then I think that's that's a good thing. Because um, studies have shown that the um, the physical adva the, the the advantage from um, having a high testosterone level does um, go away quite quickly after you take start taking um, testosterone blockers. Isn't that right? Yes. But that is right, it does. And um, like I, I've actually, um, I, I'm actually a journalist student at the moment at McLean College. So um, I did an article for them and I quoted my times went from, say, two, I was two and a half seconds slower over 100 metres. My bench press went from like a 100 and, I think 120 kg down to about, I can bench now about 75, 80, which is still impressive, but impressive for a sportswoman. And like, you know, I'd say someone like Michelle, she'd be able to bench press that. You know, it's, it's yeah, yeah, there you go. So, I can't. <laughs> you're a diver, so. <laughs> but I, you know, um, probably uh, wouldn't have the flexibility and all that sort of stuff. So, no, but um, yeah, so, um, but yeah, that's trained. And you train for, you train for different, um, you know, flexibility and a strength for sure, you know, and core and all that. And, you know, um, so I suppose different strengths for different sports. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think what the, the main point, and I think something that we need to emphasize with the wider community is <laughs> that, um, is that any hormonal advantage that someone might have transitioning, it, 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 it doesn't exist anymore once the, the, once the, the testosterone blockers are administered once somebody is has hormonally transitioned they a, 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 a trans woman doesn't benefit from the same um, testosterone benefits that she used to have and that um, so any resistance or any anxiety that there is about letting trans women compete um, against cisgendered women based on hormones is not uh, is not valid is not a valid concern uh, absolutely 100 percent the, the only thing I will say and um, and I, I think this issue now probably, I playing rugby, I could I had really great skills, you know, like because I played since I was four years old, so I catch pass all that sort of stuff, um, you know, could tackle well because I've been trained from a young age, so that's probably being socialised as a boy, um, that probably helped me, but I think as far as power, strength and all that, yeah, I, I mean, I just look, I mean, I played against a girl, she was 130 kilos, she dragged me um, 10 metres across the sideline, and um, like Gordon Tallis did, the Brett, Brett Hodgson, State of Origin, so, you know, like, a big Tongan girl, I got hit by a Tongan truck, dragged across the sideline, so... <laughs> 
Yeah, that's... Uh, I mean, it sounds what? kind of hot, but also... <laughs> <laughs> if that's what you're into. In the absolute interest yeah. of fairness, there are some physical, um, uh, maybe, advantages that a, a tr someone who's transitioned might have. If they have um, uh, had to go, gone through puberty as a boy, they might be taller, or they might, you know, have different physical oh. characteristics. Um, and so that is a, a valid concern, mm -hmm. right? But uh, is do you think it's enough of a concern um, to actually, you know, have any validity in in this argument for letting trans people compete in cisgendered sports? Um, well, I, I don't think so. Brian oh, Jackson, six foot four, brilliant player. Um, like we're all built certain ways. And I've actually often thought about that. Um, what I would have been like as an athlete if I didn't go, and I still think I would have been a good athlete. I probably would have been lighter. I would have been um, probably even quicker, you know, like, um, so, because of weight gain. So, and Hannah Mounts is probably a, a good case in point. She's an Australian women's handballer. She's now, uh, sorry, men's handballer. She's try now trying to make the women's team transition, uh, sorry, post-transition. And she's, um, she says she's put weight on and it's really hard for her to get around the court. So it's sort of, yeah, it's, um, I, I, I don't see it as being an advantage. I, like, sure, there's a, I suppose there's a, a you, um, if you went through, the, went through puberty as a male, and then there's you that wouldn't. So, um, and hopefully when these kids can, um, you know, not have to go through that male puberty, that takes that argument away because they won't have that puberty. But for us, for my generation, yeah, um, I often wonder what I would have been like and I still think I would have been a little bull terrier, so, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Caroline. It's been very insightful. I, honestly, I could talk about this stuff forever. Ryan Storr has a PhD in diversity in community sport, including disability, sexuality, gender and cultural diversity. Mr Storr is a university lecturer and writes policy for Proud to Play, an organisation advocating for creative inclusion for LGBTIQ kids when they play sport. When asked if LGBTIQ people are judged more than racially diverse people, as some people still see being LGB as a choice, he responded with, Answer is complex. Yes and no. Other forms of difference are visible, that is race, gender, sexuality, for example, hidden, can't see at times. It's because it's about sex and strict gender roles. LGBTI underpinned with gender and strict roles and how gender should be performed and policed. Opinion. As you're aware from this video, having been through the mill myself as a transgender athlete, I can only wonder if what Ryan says loosely translates to if you've gone through a gender transition, that you, then you have fallen outside those gender param parameters of what society demands, and in those people's eyes who police society, then you don't deserve the same rights as those who follow the rules. Possibly this is Hannah Mouncey's sins in the present. Hopefully it won't be an issue in the not too distant future. Caroline Late, thanks for watching.